Uh, greetings and welcome to the weekly educational rounds here at Seclair, uh, an integrative holistic psychiatric facility in Delmont, Pennsylvania, uh, where every week we attempt to bring an uh, some type of a technique, some type of news, some type of thing in the psychiatric community that you can incorporate into your health and wellness. And today I'm privileged to be joined by Seclair's medical director, Dr. Safter Chandre. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, thanks for doing what you do, Jam, to keep us excited about literature, psychiatry, mindfulness. And what time is it? I believe it's right now. Right now. Wonderful. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm learning from you as we look at the time. So it's time to review some of the literature and some of the exciting scientific news which is happening. So I thought that once a month we'll do a series of almost like a scientific update as to what's happening in the field of sciences as it will touch our lives. Um, so one of the most exciting things that has been uh, vibrating in my brain is this news that we in our brain, so, so, so I kind of set the stage for, we'll be kind of using the most respected uh, journals of psychiatry or health sciences to be able to bring in this data. So they are not our information, it is just re relaying what's happening in the world of sciences as we know them. So it's almost like doing our homework for you so that you are you are knowledgeable about some of the things which may pertain in your life. So one of this recent news of awareness was hippocampus holds two sets of neuronal stem cells. So stem cells are cells which can differentiate or become other kinds of cells. As you can imagine, we as two cell body at one time become this whole grown up human being. Eyes and ears and nose and throat and ears and all that. It means those two original cells from mom and dad become many cells but different kinds of organs and tissues and, and, and they produce the different kind of, uh, have, have different kind of outcomes. So stem cells have that potential of becoming a different kind of a cell. And so now we know in the hippocampus we have two sets of neuronal, cell, neuronal cells, stem cells. One can become a memory cell and the other it can become mood cell, so which is very interesting. We knew about the memory cells and we can cultivate new memory cells, but we didn't know about mood cells, which is very interesting. Even though it's a, it's, this model is in the animals at this time, we know that the same model as we began to learn and discern can be applicable to human beings' uh, uh, possibilities as well. So that is one. So in other words, if your mood is not very happy, maybe you need to order new cells to have happy neurons. And so that's that. The other is uh, just a lack of restful sleep may add to Alzheimer's damage. So it kind of goes back to sleep being a very important element for our health and wellness. Uh, a research team at the University of California, Berkeley, has found evidence that a lack of deep restful sleep may be the mechanism through which beta amyloid deposits in the brain, which are associated with Alzheimer's disease, destroy memory and brain on dementia. This is a topic that absolutely fascinates me. In our practice here at Seclair, Dr. Chaudhary, uh, what would your be estimate on the percentage of patients that we see that have disturbed sleep patterns? I would say 80 to 90 percent, if not more. And, and that's not a very scientific uh, number, but I would say just by the uh, anecdotal and our observation, a large number of people struggle with sleep difficulties. So what we look at here at Seclair, I know we, we look at a foundation on people can grow from. Yeah. And quite often that is a restful sleep pattern. Absolutely. So even like today I was seeing a fine uh, person, a young person, and my emphasis was on sleep element. Mood disorders, uh, addiction disorders, trauma disorders, anxiety disorders, all of these can affect our sleep patterns. And, and thus that being a very sensitive indicator of uh, of, of health and or returning to health um, and then Alzheimer being just one of the many conditions where sleep lack of restful sleep can be very damaging. So in our holistic view of an individual we 
always ask people how they sleep. That's correct. And if they're having dreams. Uh, as you can't overestimate the healing power of sleep. Hugely. Sleep is underestimated health science. Uh, there are doctors who just specialize in sleep, sleep, sleep studies and sleep sciences or sleep uh, fellowships. And, and more and more we are recognizing the, the impact of the technology on our everyday life. So having a, a computer or a television or a gadget in our own bedroom is, is not a very good strategy. It's important that bedroom is just used for being able to sleep. And as part of the holistic approach where here at Seclair we treat individuals, we do not treat diagnoses. And when we're, when we're dealing with sleep, uh, quite often it's our duty and our privilege to assist people and instruct them in sleep hygiene. That's correct. That's correct. And so sleep being uh, a sense we have gradually gotten into habits and not, of not sleeping well, um, we help people understand how and where sleep promotion can take place, like not stimuli, stimulating ourselves and brain um, uh, at a later part of the night, exercises which can be stimulating, drinking coffee, caffeine, or any other stimulants and, and such, or, or even list, or, you know, um, listening to a bad news or, or checking into an email that kind of is not a happy email. Well, let me ask you this. In your years in psychiatry and your work in the field, uh, how often is sleep been overlooked? Have you, have you seen as a psychiatrist? Hugely, hugely. Sleep is often, uh, we give people sleeping medicines, um, and then people use sleeping medicine themselves by drinking alcohol uh, or any sedatives. Or, or these days, people are using a lot of melatonin and whatnot. Um, and so often overlooked, but when taken care of, not necessarily with the best methodology. I know that uh, here I've noticed that often you attempt to avoid using hypnotic sedatives. Yeah, yeah. so I like for people to sleep by themselves. Uh, we do prescribe medicines if we need to, but I do not see that as, as, as a lifelong methodology of helping a sleep cycle to be in a good place. So, so that being said, so sleep also can be helpful for obesity. Um, so because during sleep time, we are cleaning up our body. And there's a word that echoes here. Uh, we flush, the brain can flush our toxic compounds, um, like the beta amyloid uh, and others in our body as well, you know, which can be, it's almost like the cleanup crew is home when everybody's sleeping. So it cleans up our body from all the junk that we accumulate over the days, days working. So when the brain is active and the cells put out their waste, uh, I understand that sleep is so important to flush out neurotoxins from the brain. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's nice to have a clean brain, like a, like a unlike a dirty brain. So that's so that. we can't just stick a hose in our ears. Well, you one can. <laughs> It'll clean up the brain. You may not have much left in there. <laughs> So, so with that said, I just wanted to kind of bring up a new uh, scientific journal that just started, at least it just started coming, coming to me, and it's called Genome. Very interesting, just on genes. And, and look at the first title here, in warning, may cause obesity. You know what those are? These are the antibiotics we are consuming these days. Antibiotics that we use ourselves, by reason of a medical infection or antibiotics in our food. And I could not even continue to understand the number that they were, the staggering amount of number which was given um, in maybe Jim Bucat, you know, 32 billion or what? 32,534,821 million million pounds of antimicrobials were sold for use in food producing animals. Okay. So this is how much of antibiotics we are giving, actually they're sold, they must be used. And so it comes down to the food chain and then we eat it without knowing what we are eating. These antibiotics do not disappear and, <clears throat> and they are now being linked to the ob obesity epidemic. Um, and then we are kind of recognizing, oh, these chemicals we are producing, uh, they are affecting uh, a huge number of uh, people then 147 billion 
medical cost, dollar cost of medical cost of obesity in the U.S. in 2008. Um, there's not a day go by when we are giving something about people's weight issues and helping them become more aware of the the importance of. Um, I'm mean, gonna just kind of pick up these numbers here. In 2010, doctors prescribed 258 million courses of antibiotics to outpatient. On an average, that is 833 prescriptions for every 1,000 people, with considerable variation in prescription habits from one state to the next. So, having said that, these numbers are scientific facts, and um, uh, so we have to become aware what can we do to be able to use the antibiotics more, more effectively and more judiciously, rather than, uh, you know, whenever I'm coughing. Uh, and it may be a viral condition, I end up using an antibiotic. Uh, the other thing was about the huge thing about the role of uh, various toxins and lifestyle and cancer producing mechanisms. And so uh, basically speaking, uh, we are today to just make us aware of the emerging evidence of our lifestyle on our diseases. Um, so we, we have to become very, very conscientious about that. The, the one more thing here which is on my mind is uh, how can we reduce uh, various conditions uh, impact in reducing the medical comorbidity in severe mental illnesses. So when people have depression, anxieties, conditions of that nature, they also have comorbid medical conditions. It's important that we do not treat them necessarily as one separate item alone. Uh, you know, the cardiovascular dis disorders, uh, heart conditions, diabetes, endocrine difficulties, difficulties of the thyroid gland, infections, hepatitis C, um, you know, the infection, the, the, the COPD and respiratory difficulties. So many a times medicines can cause more problems as well or medicines can alleviate problems. So coordinating care between medical healthcare professionals and psychiatric condition is becoming increasingly a very important thing to discern. Uh, so today we are just giving an evidence of hope, evidence of concern, and recognizing that we as a consumer or an informed individual need to take care of our own health, be able to talk to our providers about the care that we are getting, and also be able to discern uh, good information. Not everything that's on the internet is necessarily good information. Uh, we have to see where that information source is and is that a good scientifically based, evidence-based information that we can apply in our own personal life. Uh, so at CCLEAR, sometimes we are just even looking around for various data, various information and, and scientific validation to those information so that you as a consumer don't have to try to figure out among millions of data of information which one to believe and not, so we try to assist to discern what good information can be used in your particular situation. So what you're telling us is that the methodologies that you present here, the things that you suggest, have depth and weight behind them? The better, uh, or else they would not hold their grounds. So we are trying to get the data, which is scientific information, which has solid research behind it, so that when you're trying to look, it's almost like if you're looking for a good plumber, you want the one who actually knows what to do. Uh, so we are your scientific plumbers in the field of uh, healthcare sciences as it pertains to psychiatric conditions. So how often, Dr. Chaudhary, does someone come in and tell you that I read this in a book, or I saw this on the internet, or my sister's cousin's boyfriend's next door neighbor uh, says this? It's okay to hear, but that's also important to not fear, but see if this is a good solid information. Uh, there are many a times I have picked up a book and within uh, within f five to ten pages I can tell the author is writing about a subject matter that they don't have any clue about. Uh, so one has to really kind of understand that the science is accumulated over good, good evidence and if the evidence is missing it becomes anecdotal and that's okay but that doesn't hold the truth of scientific testing that's very important. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Chaudhary, and we look forward to your next visit. Appreciate your time, and it's always fun to do a scientific review and have fun with it. You, and a free prescription today would be one of hope.
hope and joy and dance call zumba <laughs> thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me